All right. Well, welcome uh, to, oh no, it's wage an hour. How do the administrative, executive, and professional exemptions work? All right. So we got a lot of stuff to cover today. And I'm going to send to you the handout. And if, um, yeah, there we go. All right. Um, if um, you check uh, about a week down the road, then everything is going to be posted for you uh, under the free lunch and learns, the handouts, uh, the video, everything will be there within the week. So if you have to leave early or if someone missed this program, it's going to be posted there for them. All right. Now, first and foremost, all right, uh, my new chapter, the uh, Southern South Central Ohio Human Resource Council has its meeting coming up on April 18th, and this is virtual. So everybody can join. Everybody can join uh, from wherever you are. And so pretty much every from everybody from Columbus South could certainly join this chapter. All right. And it's going to be looking at recruitment and retention strategies. All right. So very, very hot topic that's close to us all these days. All right. So sounds good. I would encourage you to join this chapter. I have joined this chapter. Um, just love it. And there's the hot link to go and read more about it. And if you do belong to this chapter, then guess what? Um, next, uh, well, actually, next month's our Lunch and Learn. If you haven't, if you're already signed up for this, then you already automatically are signed up for the next ones. Once you sign up for a Lunch and Learn, you're always signed up until you opt out. Okay, so next month, Friday, May 3rd, and I've changed the dates around a little bit because I had some scheduling conflicts. Understanding Ohio's new recreational marijuana law. And I will tell you, I have not seen a legal, well, it's very rare that I see a legal substance abuse policy. Very rare. Okay. And we want to make sure that we're in compliance with OSHA. And we want to make sure that we are setting the standard for what your, your company wants to do with the new recreational marijuana law. So we're going to take an awful look at an awful long look at that. And we're going to take a look at what it does to your brain. Okay, so you got a few ways of participating here today. One is to raise your hand or chat me up. How many people here you think your people should be able to come to work with their brains? So you can raise your hand or chat me up. What do you think? Is it important to come to work with your brain? Yep, getting lots of uh, hands up here. That's that's fantastic. Okay, yep, Gene is telling me yes, absolutely, yeah. I'm going to show you ab absolutely why what you do on your own time is not just your business. It's our business too. And anybody who's been to any of my sessions knows that I'm heavy into the brain. You really do have to make sure that you take your brain with you wherever you go. That is a rule, okay? And I'm gonna show you what marijuana, heroin, all this type of stuff does to your brain. You do not want these people working for you, okay? And we'll distinguish between the edibles and things like this and smoking pot. We'll distinguish there. Okay, and if you are a member of South Central Ohio Human Resource Council, you get to come to all of my paid sessions uh, my half day sessions for free. For free. All the half day sessions that I do, you get in for free. And next one on April 22nd is going to be Adventures in Babysitting, Effectively Coaching Hypersensitive and Offensive Employees. All right, now let's just play with this. How many people have problem people back at the ranch? Let's take a look at our Screen here, you can put your hand up. Yeah, getting lots of good hands up here. <laughs> yeah, okay, there we go, absolutely. So I will tell you, yep, had them. And this is a big core type of session. You cannot be in human resources and you cannot supervise people if you can't address and resolve conflict. And I'll go one more. You cannot be in a leadership position 
and be a passive aggressor. You know, those nice people who smile to your face, tell you everything's fine, and then stab you in the back when you're not looking. Okay. And you can't get the attackers. Simon Cow, or at least the stereotype of Simon Cow, should not be running anything, particularly when we don't have employees to hire. Okay, well, we've got a lot of stuff to look at today, and I'm just reminding everybody the sales are over on this, but I do bundle all of my programs together at 975 for all of these types of programs, and you can hit those links when you get a chance to see what is happening. Okay, so I'm going to stop that share here for a minute, and I am going to go and show you, because we got a lot of folks here who are members of the Master HR Toolkit. Now, you don't have to be a subscriber to the Master HR Toolkit to come to these. Absolutely. You, you can come to these and get a lot of information. Again, I'm going to post all my slides for you. So that is going to be available to you for everybody here. Okay. So let me share my screen again. If I can bring up Zoom. Okay, there we go. Trying to get Zoom to be working for me here. Okay, share my screen again. I'm actually starting to figure this out a little bit. Okay, so here's my website. Gonna go to my account, hit downloads. Okay, and so this these programs are designed to help people understand how to use the Master HR Toolkit, and also to learn how to do these types of things, like who's exempt and who is not exempt. So I'm gonna go in here. Now, first and foremost, this is what comes up for you Master Toolkit people. So we're gonna go down and we wanna learn something about the Fair Labor Standards Act. So I'm gonna go down here. One thing I can do is go to the book. So, oh no, it's wage an hour. And this is a, you kind of see, Everything is indexed for you. So, and actually this is quite long. It's like 90 some pages. So I go up here. I want to learn about, let's see here. I want to learn about the executive exemption. So what do I do? Boink, hit the tab, takes me right to it. Takes me right to it. Okay. So having, having already done that, then what do I want to do? Okay, let's go back here. Stinking Zoom, right? Let's see if I can figure this out. Okay. Well, let me just explain further on down. Doink. Further on down, I got videos for you. All right, so honestly, I don't like to go through and read a bunch of stuff because reading is like work. So what do I like to do? I like to listen. So there's videos down there that actually four or five hours of videos for the Fair Labor Standards Act. And you can go and hit any topic that you want. All right, so that's just a little guide there as to how easy it is to go and navigate your way through all this stuff. Okay, so let's get off to the races. And since my uh, volume isn't working today for some god awful reason, okay, we are going to uh, do everything in chat. So I'm going to leave the chat up over here. Uh, oh, Pat, I love this. You are the problem person. Well, then, Pat, you should probably go coach yourself. All right, now, chances are, and I understand how this goes, are you the problem person because you speak up on things that should be done? Or is it that you just like to complain? So let's just, so what is it, Pat? Are you bringing up issues that they just don't like to hear? Okay. I'm assuming that's the case. Okay. That we call those people whistleblowers. Yep, yeah, Pat. There you go. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. I love the whistleblowers. And I will tell you right now. This is a sensitive topic, who's exempt and who is not exempt. Because the first thing we like to do with horrible leaders, like NASA, that they used to have, if you spoke up over Challenger, 
you got fired because kill the messenger. Okay, freeze right there. How many people have ever worked for an organization that if you spoke up, yeah, Gene is telling me, bring up issues that need to be addressed. Okay, that's a kill the messenger, isn't it? Gina, Pat, when you bring up what they don't want to hear, they bully you or claim you're emotional. Oh, Joe, you, yeah, that is happening to me right now. Absolutely, because I will tell you, and, and those of you who know me know, I am not a cheerleader. And I get calls, that, hey, we need a mo motivational speaker. We need a motivational speaker to come and address our conference. And I'm like, well, then I'm not what you want. I like to make things fun, but a motiv motivational speaker is a freaking cheerleader. Gets up there and tells you how good everything is. They remind me of a bunch of cats. I got four cats. Four cats and a dog. Good therapy animals. It reminds me of when my four cats sit around, lick each other, and tell each other how good they taste. No. 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 I will tell you. I will tell you what you need to hear. Might not be what you want to hear, but I will tell you what you need to hear, and you will be one cat and one doggy. Okay. I don't know if they groom each other, Gina, but that kind of strikes me with a lot of leadership we've got. Okay. Now, those are the those are the messengers. We kill them. Then, does anybody know what we call somebody who goes outside the organization? Like happened at Philip Morris and the people who spoke up and said, we are intentionally trying to make cigarettes more addictive so people will buy them and then die. What do we call those people? People who go public. What do we call them? They're not, they're messengers, but what do we call them? Anybody have a chat for me? That's a whistleblower. Kill the whistleblowers. I will tell you right now. I love, there you go, Mara. Absolutely. I love the whistleblowers. I Yeah, troublemakers. Absolutely. Okay. Now, be very cautious with what we're going to talk about in here today. Okay. Approach this lightly. And I will tell you, you can turn non-exempt people into exempt people sometimes okay so let's take this slow and make sure everybody is on the same page exempt versus non-exempt now exempt means you are exempt from overtime just make sure everybody understands what we're talking about non-exempt means you are not exempt from overtime so what's that mean if you work over 40 hours in a given week you get time and a half. That's all it means. It doesn't apply to anything else. Exempt means you are exempt from the law. It is like the state and federal government are giving you a little card that says you can speed. And if you're pulled over by a highway patrolman and you're going 95 and a 35, which I don't recommend, even if it's legal, you, got, you get to walk. You are getting an exemption from the law. Now, there are three hurdles you got to cross. A couple of them are rather tricky. But let's look at the minimum salary test. Then we're going to look at the duties test. And I'll mention a little bit on the salary test. And if you want to spend more time, if you want to do a lunch and learn on the salary test, then let me know. Actually, uh, after May... I'm starting to plan for June, July, and the rest of the year. Let me know what you want for your lunch and learns. We could do whatever you want to do. And all of these have come from suggestions from you. All right? So absolutely. So first and foremost, minimum salary. Now, what's that? Okay, minimum salary, as of about four years ago, is $35,568 a year. That's really $684 a week. Okay. And I uh, had a lot of clients, a lot of nonprofits and whatever, had to move their salaried people, their salaried non-exempt people. I'm sorry, God, salaried exempt people to non-exempt because they couldn't afford the raise. Well, you got to do some calculations. How many hours a week is that person working? Okay, so it, right now it's $35,568. You've all adjusted to that. Get your antennas up here. Here's the big change in the law that I am absolutely convinced is coming this year, and it's coming right from uh, Joe Biden. 
He's already got it proposed. Wants to raise this to about $50,000 a year. So those of you um, who, who are interested in this topic, keep an eye on it and I'll have a bulletin that goes out. Oh, Roseanne sent me a suggestion for a lunch and learn on the salary test and avoiding improper deductions. Thank you, Rose. Thank you. Anybody who has a suggestion to me, because I'm, I'm sort of looking between, you'll see me looking between the screen here and the chat. If you could email that to me, Rose, I would really appreciate it. If you would email it to me, that way I've got it. Because after this is done, I don't necessarily go back and look through all the chat. So anybody out there, it's all fair game. So you want to send me something, please send it to me in um, in an email. Okay, so those of you who are putting grant proposals out there, get ready. $50,000 is coming. It's coming. $50,000 a year. Now, minimum salary does not apply to outside salespeople, teachers, or anybody who's practicing law or medicine. Well, nobody really cares too much about lawyers and doctors. Teachers comes up a lot. Head start. Those are teachers. Absolutely. So, yeah, you don't have a minimum. And isn't that sad? Really? I mean, teachers? Oh, yeah, up there's. I mean, outside sales, you pay yourself, right? You're outside the organization making sales. Lawyers and doctors, nobody complains that they don't make enough money. Teachers? Hey, it's, it's, it's in there and it's still there. So those of you with Head Start programs, minimum salary does not apply. Okay, administrative and professional employees, you can also be paid on a fee basis, but it's got to be above that minimum salary. Okay, minimum salary is pretty much a fastball down the middle. Now, here's what Rose was talking about. and We could spend a whole session. Rose, this is a great, great suggestion. Uh, the salary test. You got to pay people who are exempt on a salary basis, except for computer people, which is a whole nother thing to look at. But you got to pay them on a salary. What's that mean? They are being paid for what they do. They're on a salary. I am paying you $1,000 a week, let's say, or you know, uh, $200 a day, let's just say, I don't know. And that's what I'm paying you for the salary test. If you come in and open your mail and go home sick, I owe you for the day. I owe you for the whole day because you have performed a service for me. You performed a service for me. All right. Well, now think about this. If you performed a service for me and it took you five minutes, I pay you for the whole day, 200 bucks. If you work 10 hours, I still pay you for the whole day because you performed a service. I'm not counting your hours. It is irrelevant to me how many hours you work. So that's where we get salary. You get $200 or whatever for the day. And that's basically how we decide what we're going to pay you. The problem you get into is when you start counting their hours for the purposes of making sure that they work 40 hours a week. That is gonna invalidate the salary test and you're in big trouble. Okay, so just enough said right now that you gotta pay them for the day if they perform any services for you at all. And that means they're going home sick and they're working on their laptop, you gotta pay them for the day. Now, wage an hour doesn't care if you pay them from sick time, they don't care. As long as they get paid, the problem you get into is when they run out of sick time, okay? Well, let's get to the meat here. Now, first of all, if someone is going to be exempt from the law, you got to remember that the burden of proof is against you, the employer. Wage and hour law for exemptions is 100% the opposite um, for um, every other law. Like if you are accused of sexual harassment, if you're accused of sexual harassment. The burden of proof is on the employee. The employee has to prove that you did it, that you did it beyond a reasonable doubt. Not so with wage and hour. With wage and hour exemptions, the presumption in the law is that 
everybody is non-exempt. So you have to prove by clear and convincing evidence, means about 60, 70%, that they are exempt. So you understand you're getting exemption from following the law. And I'll tell you, this is what catches a lot of employers. I will hear an employer say, well, I think it's close, but this person's exempt. No. If it's close, you lose. If it's close, you lose. Now, don't mess with wage and hour because if you lose, um, you haven't been keeping any hours for this person. So guess what? How would you know for the last two years for a non-willful violation? How much do you owe this person for the hours they worked? Because you don't have any records. So guess where they get that information from? They get it from the employee. It comes from the employee. I'll tell you right now, don't mess with wage an hour because that employee can sit down, go get a calendar and just make all kinds of stuff up. Oh, and attorney's yep. fees are guaranteed. Yep. So let me tell you, I'm glad you're here today because you want to make sure, particularly after COVID, and we have moved so many duties around that these people really are still exempt. Okay, is everybody with me? All right, looking at the chat here. Uh, Joe, um, FMCSA, you're sending me a note here from Hose. Um, can you uh, elaborate on that, what you're talking about? Because FMCSA, the, is this government program? Because I'm sure a lot of people out there would be interested in what you're talking about there. We'll give Joe, Joe a minute here to type in what he's got there. Okay. Um, oh, truck drivers. Yes. Thank you, Joe. Truck drivers. Yeah. Truck drivers. Good point. And actually, some of you have been working on with your uh, DOL folks and things like this. Truck drivers are in an area all their own, which, Joe, that's a good one. Maybe for all you folks out there who move people with disabilities around that have their DOL and things like this, we should take a look at that. But I will tell you, um, yeah, Joe's absolutely right. And and Joe, that's such a good point. I mean, we could look at computer people and all these other folks. We're going to focus on the executive folks, but don't forget what Joe's saying here. There's a lot of folks out there and other types of exemptions. Good point, Joe. Absolutely. Okay. Executive. So what is an executive? Okay. So this is the duties test. We looked at the minimum salary. We looked at the salary. Now let's get into the nasty part of the duties. This is the part you can really move a lot of stuff around in. And let me just make it clear. If you work for a micromanager, you, probably everyone in your organization or most of the people in your organization are non-exempt. They actually have to have authority to do what you say they do. And just because it's on paper, just because you got it in your job description, does not mean that's what happens in real life. So I want everybody to take note of this. It's got to actually happen. So executive, first and foremost, the primary duty, which means most of your time, is managing the enterprise or some department of that enterprise Okay, that means you're engaged in managerial and supervisory duties. You must customarily and regularly direct the work of at least two full-time people. Now, freeze right there. I have never seen anybody who manages two people who met this exemption, who didn't also have managerial duties in there. I mean, think about it. You're going to spend 20 hours a week-ish Managing two employees? Well, these must be the two most worthless employees on the planet. I mean, how dumb are these people? No, no, you really want to make sure that that there's other duties in there. So we have to give them authority. And these folks have to have the authority to hire or fire other employees or make recommendations of a particular weight, such as to the hiring, firing, advancement, promotion, or any other tangible changes. Okay, so this is why assistant managers could be exempt. 
because maybe they have two or more people. They customarily and regularly direct the, this work. More than half of their time is spent managing the enterprise. And their, their opinion is given particular weight by the manager. Absolutely. Now, as a general rule, they got to spend at least 50% of their time engaging in supervisory and managerial duties. Now, this is only a guideline, but I will tell you right now, if you are dealing with a wage and hour investigator and you fall below 55, 60%, you got a lot of explaining to do. Now, you could make the argument that now they're only doing 40% of their time performing these managerial duties, but the primary focus, what they're doing is so important that they they that this counts. It's the primary focus. But I'll tell you right now, I don't think you want to do a lot of explaining to wage and hour investigators, and here's why. Wage and hour investigators get their bonuses and get promoted by the amount of fines they bring in. Yeah, let me say that again. If you want to move up at wage and hour and you're an investigator, you better be handing out some fines. Does that strike anybody as a conflict of interest? Yep. Does it strike anybody that maybe this is not fair? Arr. This isn't fair. Fair is where you show pigs. It didn't have anything to do with fair. So you tell you right now, again, it's your burden to prove. The presumption is they're non-exempt. And if you lose one of these arguments, that employee can go back, make up hours for the last two years, three years if it's willful, which means you knew and did it anyway. And you got to pay attorney's fees. You're into the tens of thousands of dollars. I'll tell you right now, I would rather have a harassment suit any day to defend a harassment suit any day than a wage and hour suit. Because all the marbles are really on those duties. Okay, so what do you want to make sure? So now we're going to move some stuff around. Okay, what is the primary management duties that you want? So you kind of see, I want to be able to move these duties into somebody's job. I want them to be able to perform these duties. So what are managerial duties? Interviewing. Selecting and training employees, setting and adjusting their rates of pay, their hours, directing the work of employees, maintaining production and sales records, appraising their productivity and efficiency, Okay, recommending for promotion. You're handling complaints and grievances. You're starting to feel a real manager type of thing. Disciplining employees, planning the work, determining techniques that should be used and how to properly do the job. All right. That you are... Uh, determining what materials, supplies, machinery, all of this stuff. Look at this list here. This is right from the regulations. So guess what I want to do? I want to get those duties into these jobs. That's what I want to do. All right. So I'll tell you, if you ever hear somebody as being a working supervisor, a, a, a shiver should go down your spine. A working, what's a working supervisor? Oh, they're on the line doing the same work as the employees. Okay, then right away, you got a lot of explaining to do. Because if they're spending 30 hours a week on the line doing the same thing, they're not going to qualify for an exempt status. You got to give them authority and responsibility. So first of all, with wage and hour, you never use the term working supervisor. Get that out of your vocabulary. Get these types of duties in there. And it's not just that you give them this stuff. They've got to have some actual authority and real weight in their recommendations. Okay. So, and again, I'm going to send these slides to you. All right. So, everybody with me? All right. So, what's it mean to operate a department or subdivision? Well, you know, think about it look at an organizational chart. You've got different departments and subdivisions. So if you are in charge of human resources, or if you are in charge of shift one, right? Uh, if you're in charge of shift two, if you're in charge of accounting, 
you are not just once in a while, but customarily, you, you are you are regularly overseeing that department or subdivision. This is differentiated in the regulations than just a bunch of guys or gals put together from time to time. Like, okay, I want you to go over and you're a working supervisor and I want you to oversee these guys over here that are working on this machine. Well, that sounds like an ad hoc type of group of people and that's not gonna qualify. That's not gonna qualify. And I'll tell you, I've had CEOs and COOs absolutely convinced that that is a division. No. Does it show up on your org chart? Is it on your organizational chart? And if it's not, that's a strike. Now, can you overcome that to show that this is a permanent, regular type of area that you oversee? Well, yeah, but then why isn't it on the organizational chart? I'll tell you, you, you got to make sure you know how these cards are played. And two or more people. All right, I touched on this a little bit. You got two or more full-time people. Now, that could be four part-timers. But honestly, if you really think, oh, they're supervising two people, so they're exempt. Oh, no. Unless you can make the argument that these are the two dumbest, most worthless, inbred employees on the planet. And what do you do? Well, I got to spend 10, 12, 13 hours a week just watching this one moron. Oh, I don't think so. I don't think so. No. So honestly, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten people. Yeah. So I got a manager and I got an assistant manager who are spending most of their time supervising a dozen people, reviewing them, that they're interviewing, that they're hearing grievances, that they're, well, yeah, that makes sense. But this two employee thing, don't think just because you give them two employees to supervise that they're going to be covered. They're that now we're good. They supervise two people. No, it does not work like that at all. Okay. And I'll tell you right now, you lip service isn't going to get it. Lip service isn't going to get it. You've got to have the actual authority. And this has been 20 years now. In the regulations. I used to refer to, here's how long I've been doing this. I used to refer to this as the new regulations. Well, I ain't new anymore. Um, you're 20 years old. You've got to have some real authority. Real authority. Now, freeze right there. Do you see how micromanagers destroy exempt status? They destroy it because you don't really have the authority to do anything. Because the micromanager has to interview anybody. The micromanager doesn't listen to anybody else. The micromanager, no. You actually have to have some weight in your decision. And that isn't just occasionally. This got to happen all the time. It's got to happen regularly. So it's like, well, I went to this person on this one investigation. No. Where are they with the scheduling? Where are they with the grievances? Where are they with the harassment uh, complaints. Where are they? You got to be ready for all that. Okay. And I stuck this in here today because we used, to, I still hear this every so often about the sole charge exception. Okay. That maybe you are the sole person in charge at a 7 Eleven. Well, you're automatically um, exempt. You meet the duties test. No. No. The sole charge exception where you are. The sole person in charge there is gone. Instead, if you are a 20% owner or whatever, okay, which is why this comes up an awful lot, you need to be, and you're actively engaged in the management of the enterprise, that's really what it was replaced with, part owners. Now, understand the other test, if you are running the 7-Eleven, are you spending the bulk of your time managing the enterprise. Now, what would be managing the enterprise? You're overseeing stock. You are ordering stock. You're setting the schedule. You're giving discipline. You're giving coaching. You're, gonna, you're interviewing. You kind of see the old test still applies. So just because you're the only one there in charge doesn't mean you're automatically uh, exempt anymore. That test is dead and gone. Okay. Questions. Let's take a breath. 
Everybody understanding the administrative or the executive exemption. Going to open up the chat here for me to take a peek. I didn't see anything come in, but I just want to make sure that everybody's got her. Yep, Bridget's got it. Very good. Very good. This is nasty stuff. This is nasty stuff. Um, sexual harassment is interesting. Yeah. Title VII claims are interesting. Disability claims are interesting. Even FMLA claims are interesting. This is as boring and dull as it gets. This is dull. It is tedious, but you see why those job descriptions need to be updated. Now, we talked about the ADA. You got to make sure you have the, the essential functions on there. If, if you don't have the essential functions on a job description, it, I'll tell you, at least in Ohio, it's not an essential function. And you better have on your job descriptions what they're doing. And it's not a bad idea to put those in order in which they're doing. Them. How much time? Okay. Well, let's sail away from the executive exemption. This is the most abused administrative exemption. Oh, yeah, I got an administrative person. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll stick him in there. Yeah, that's my clerk or that's my, that's my executive assistant. It's amazing how many executives think that because they have an executive assistant, that that person should be exempt. No, no. There's a test for that, and it's pretty tough. Now, again, you should recognize this. Their primary duty, about 50% of the time, must be office or non-manual. So guess what? Your maintenance guys don't fit here. Blue collar doesn't fit here. Office or non-manual work directly related to the management or general business operations. And primary duty includes the exercise, get this, discretion and independent judgment in significant matters. Okay, it means you've got to have some expertise to draw upon and, and make decisions. And you are independent of other people. Now, you can still get approval, but again, you have to have a specialty here. Okay, you are in charge of things. All right, so let's delve ahead here. Okay, so let's look at what's it mean? to have most of your duties directly related to management or general business operations. Ooh, there's a bunch of stuff. And again, I cut and pasted this right from the regs. So what do you wanna do? You are working in tax, finance, accounting. Now understand, you're not a bookkeeper. You are not, and you're not doing payroll. Payroll is the kiss of death for an administrative exemption. No, because you're not exercising any independent judgment. So what are you doing here? Well, the general business operations. This is human resources. This is your safety and health department. Your marketing people, the people who are in your marketing and advertising, quality control, auditing, okay? Uh, employee benefits, labor relations, government relations, computer. These are pretty much your staff function people. They are not production people. It's directly related to management or general business operations. It is not the production. These are staff positions, not production. All right. Now, you can qualify for this administrative exemption if maybe... Um, you're dealing with the, the management, general operations of the employee's customers. So therefore, you see, you have an expertise. You're an advisor or a consultant to the clients or customers, like tax experts, financial. That could qualify. That's a very different type of business, okay? Uh, what about someone scheduling the orders? Okay, Philip, great question here. What about someone scheduling the orders? Okay, uh, are they exercising some discretion or are they just filling out a form? Okay, so let's say I've got somebody who is, you know, making orders and I've got to decide. Perfect example. 
you could have somebody as a scheduler in a manufacturing operation. They are in charge of making sure that all of the ISO procedures are being followed. They are making sure that all of the paper is being ordered correctly and how much you're going to order, that all of the oil for the machines, that all these, they're exercising a lot of independent judgment. You kind of see their staff, they're supporting. They are not in the production. So depends on what we mean with orders, but absolutely could be. But remember, most of their time is spent performing those types of operations, not clerical. Payroll is clerical. Okay. Now, uh, let's let's look at this here, uh, Philip, because what do you got to really consider? Well, do they have some authority? That's your discretion and independent judgment. You kind of see in the similarities between the executive exemption and the administrative. Very, very similar. They use different words. Why? I don't know. But discretion and independent judgment. Okay, wonderful. That is exercising authority. So can they interpret policies? Can they interpret the operating policy? So someone somewhere wrote the policies. Does your administrative person have the right or the ability to interpret those? Render decisions. Okay. Do they carry out major assignments with, uh, you know, con for the uh, business? Okay. Do, do they perform work that affects operations? Okay. Like ordering or scheduling, something like that. Whether the employee has the authority to commit you to something. Okay. Like financially, can they sign a contract for you? Okay. You see how the micromanagers are going to kill this? All right. Does the employee have the authority to waive or deviate from policies and procedures? Do they have that authority? Okay. So you kind of see just, and, and just because those decisions might be reversed or revised doesn't mean that they weren't exercising discretion and judgment. Okay. Give you a great example. Executive assistants. I run into this all the time where there is an executive who wants his or her uh, assistant to be exempt. Why? Because they report to him or her. So anybody who reports to me is a very important person because I'm a very important person. And guess what? They should be exempt. That is not one of the tests. However, what do we do? Okay. Um, I had one client once and they wanted the executive assistant to be um, exempt. Okay, great. So guess what? We're going to give her duties that make her exempt. So what are we going to do? She is in charge of contracting and making decisions on all the vending machines. All the vending machines. She, saw, she brings in the... Now, can that be overturned by the president? Yeah. But she researches them. She makes decisions. She makes sure that everybody gets paid from that. Uh, she is also in charge of the party house. Who rents the party house? How much is it? She's also in charge of the grounds. Okay, who's going to cut the grass? Who's going to uh, mulch? How much are we going to pay them? You kind of see how I can give her a lot of things to do that are going to make her exempt. Typing up the president's correspondence is not an exempt duty. There's no independent judgment or discretion. Unless the president says, hey, go write me a memo to such and such and tell him how mad I am about this. Well, I don't run into too many uh, presidents and CEOs that like to do that. But you kind of see, you got to give him or her more discretion and independent judgment. Paula's saying, I get a lot of, they don't want to pay overtime, so we need to make them exempt. You know, Paula, there you go. So, Paula, great question here, Paula. I get a lot of, they don't want to pay overtime, so we just need to make them exempt, okay? And Paula, I actually work for an employer up in Shelby, Ohio. Yeah, there you go. Um, I was at the hospital, and the president wanted, this was 25 years ago, the president wanted to make everyone exempt by paying them on salary. No, 
you have to pay exempt people on salary, but you can't turn around and make all of the x-ray techs, nurses, everybody in the hospital exempt by just putting them on salary. It's really kind of funny. Yeah, I grew up in Shelby Carter. Ah, oh, Carter. Yeah, we, we should have a, a chat about this. That was an interesting thing. Uh, so it's illegal. Now, Paula, and this is a good point for everybody. Can your employer make everybody exempt if they want to and pay them salary and think that's okay? Yeah, you can. You can do anything you want to do. More power to you. Knock yourself out. You can do whatever you want to do, should you? And I'll tell you, this one right here, it's not sexy, right? Wage and hour claims don't make the front page because they're not interesting. Okay. So what happens if you get caught? If you get caught, you will owe these people two years of overtime and they're just going to make it up and you got to pay it. Oh, and by the way, that's times two damages. We call that liquidated damages. Okay. So that's something that could happen. The attorney's fees absolutely will happen. And employment attorneys today, the average is around five, six, seven hundred dollars an hour. You're going to regret that. And again, you would rather have someone who uh, is claiming harassment or discrimination. Okay, so Paula, absolutely. And I work with a lot of employers as to or, uh, HR people and consultants. How do you deliver this message? Okay, well, I'm going to deliver this message, and then it's up to them. Because the last thing you want to have happen, Paula, is an employee gets mad, calls wage an hour, and you get into this kind of trouble. I'll tell you, I, I don't see these things being settled for less than $50,000. Because the employer always bristles, and what happens? Well, we end up paying the other side's attorney's fees. The attorney's fees are probably going to be worse than the settlement. Absolutely. Actually, almost always attorney's fees dwarf it. So good point. All right. Now, back 20 years ago, the Department of Labor said, look, just because you're following a manual guideline or other established procedures, okay, that's okay. It used to be that if you were following a manual or guideline or some procedures that, that you were not going to be exempt. You can be. Today, you can be. And I underlined and put in italics. But you want to make sure that you have a special advanced or specialized knowledge of skills. Okay, so you have the expertise to interpret these. And a perfect example is someone who is maybe uh, is, is an attorney, not an administratively exempt person, but let's say it's an HR person. Okay, they are interpreting what the regulations say. They are interpreting what guidelines need to be met for uh, OSHA or something like this. Well, just because you read the guidelines to something doesn't mean you know all the case law and all the instances behind it. So yeah, if you're following a manual or guideline, that's okay, but we wanna make sure this person has some specific expertise to go along with it. Okay, so what do the regulations say? Just some examples. You're advising management, you're planning, negotiating with outside parties is a great one. Representing the company outside the organization, purchasing, promoting sales, doing business research. Okay. See why I try to get those types of things into jobs to make them exempt. These are the kisses of death. These all. Oh, do not be looking at these types of things to try to make yourself exempt uh, under the administrative exemption. Typing, filing. Answering correspondence. Now, you're just following the director of whoever you're reporting to. That doesn't apply. Okay. Now, again, you're answering correspondence on your own authority, interviewing applicants. That all counts. You see the authority or discretion and independent judgment that's coming into play. All right. So, and they have to be significant. They've got to be important. Like the vending machines. Like the landscaping. Like the cleaning crew. All right, so there's your test. Questions about the administrative test before we sail away? Oh my gosh, Jeannie, Jeannie Lloyd. Okay, great consultant out there. Jeannie, no, Jeannie, oh my God, 20 some years. 
Great, great comment here from Jeannie. You're lucky if it doesn't end up as a class action. Absolutely. If you are violating wage an hour with one person, chances are you're doing it with a bunch of people. And if you get a class of people, which could be anywhere from 10 to a few hundred, it'll put you out of business. It'll put you out of business. I mean, the attorney's fees will kill you. Actually, one class action for most attorneys will set them up for life. Don't get caught on that one. And you don't really have a class action usually with discrimination and harassment. Those are very unique types of situations. They can be class actions, but this lends itself to class action all the time. Okay, questions? Okay. Now, learned professionals. Okay, so here's a fun one. All right, we've actually broken that down into a couple of fields here, but this is very rare. Okay, but you might have some people out here like this. 50% uh, of your time requires advanced knowledge, which means it's predominantly intellectual. And you are consistently, notice that's a new word in here for us, consistently exercising discretion and judgment. The field, mu it must be in a field of science and learning, and I want you to thank doctors. Okay, the advanced knowledge must be customarily acquired by a prolonged course of specialized intellectual instruction. Scientists and actually lawyers kind of fit in here. All right, so this is a very high test. Okay, so what's this mean for advanced knowledge and intellectual in character and consistent exercise of judgment? Okay, just because uh, you're a veteran or long-term status I've been doing this for years. Doesn't mean you have a license from the state of Ohio to do it. Well, I've been advising people for years. Well, are you actually a psychologist? A high school level diploma isn't going to do it. You've got to have something college, okay? Oh, here we go, Paula. Even uh, though we went through a wage and hour claim, I still, I still hear that a lot. You are correct. It wasn't settled for less than 50000 The attorneys really thought uh, we could uh, win the case. However, it cost over a million dollars to win. Yeah. Everybody looking at the, well, she sent me a direct message, but Paula, you're right on the target here. Um, had a wage and hour claim. You didn't settle it for 50 grand. Your attorney said they thought you could win. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I should do a, set, a lunch and learn on how big law firms really work. And now, not all of them, but pretty much every one I've ever seen. And the two I worked for, Oh my gosh, put companies out of business. Bill, 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 bill. And I will tell you right now, I'll tell you right now, you don't mess with wage and hour claims. You settle these things, you get the heck out because the threat of attorney's fees could kill you. And this one cost over a million dollars. It is not unusual to see these wage and hour cases to have four or $500,000 in attorney's fees. And right away, that's such an unreal number. People go, oh, that can't be right. Yes, it is. Believe me. Okay, so you're going to have an advanced degree here. Okay, so what typically qualifies? Okay, law, medicine, theology, okay, uh, engineering, arch you see what a high level of education these people are going to have to have. They're probably going to have to have licenses. This is unusual. Okay, so, you know, usually have to have specific academic training. Most of you don't deal with this, okay? And think about it. You're gonna use that degree all the time, customarily, okay? And that's what lawyers do. That's what engineers do, real engineers, okay? And so that's our test. There it is again, just for everybody to see. Now, you could be creative. What's that mean? Well, you, you have a job that requires invention, imagination, originality, or talent in a recognized field of artistic or creative endeavor. Okay, what's that mean? Well, this makes sense, doesn't it? You play the cello. You make your living being a painter. You're a cartoonist. You're a novelist. Okay? This isn't Joe who usually works on the line, and you're going to let him design your next uh, marketing campaign. No. Actors, musicians, real creative professionals. 
Okay. So chances are most of you do not fall into this one, but it is part of the learned professional, and I felt obligated. Okay, those are your codes for today, and I'll be posting this in about a week here. Uh, it's a lot of stuff. Hope everybody's brain is full. Final questions for everybody? Yeah, very full, Bridget. This is a this it, and honestly, we just looked at the administrative, executive, and learned professionals. There's a lot. There's a five-hour video <laughs> for you master HR toolkit, and you're not going to sit down and listen to five hours. And let me just clue you in: you go to the master toolkit area, and you want to learn about travel time. Oh, and thank you so much for everybody. I love to do these. I think we're, I'm trying to help the HR profession as much as I possibly can. And I want to make sure that you're getting the education that you should be getting. All right. But, um, oh, yeah. Uh, travel time, training time, anything you folks want to talk about. As far as I'm concerned, these are your sessions. And we will look at them for whatever you want to do. Okay. So, oh, yes, uh, certainly want to make sure that we are making this fit for you. And I will tell you, one last plug, I want people to go out there and join the uh, Southern or South Central Ohio Human Resource uh, Group, because I'll tell you, they're doing a lot of stuff. I give a lot of free stuff away to members. Sign up. We're building a great chapter down there. And I will tell you, just absolutely love dealing with these folks. It Put it this way, I drive an hour one way to get there, okay? And it's amazing to me. We got a lot of folks from Cincinnati that are coming up, a lot of folks from Columbus that are going down with me, a lot, because the chapter is that good. It truly, truly is. So yes, have a great weekend to all of you folks out there. And I will have one last call for questions if anybody has them. But I want you to go use this stuff because we have got to you got to train like an Olympic athlete to make sure that you are an HR professional. And I mean a professional. You 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 absolutely do not get to be a good HR person by being a nice, happy person. The days of the nice, happy people are gone. And we want to protect our organizations and we want to create organizations where our people want to come and work for us. Okay. Well, hey, everybody have a great, great weekend. And if you have suggestions for what you want to see next, email them to me, scott at scottwarwick.com. I read them all and that's how I plan these agendas. I want to put out there what's good for you. Hey, everybody have a great one and take care.